Welcome to the call on the first upgrade. Let me just hand it over to you, Paul. Uh, thank you for finding the time to talk to us about your book. It's my pleasure. Um, so as it's a small group, I also don't mind getting interrupted and hopefully there'll be time for some interactions. Um, Janus had asked me to sort of take 15, 20 minutes to introduce some of the thinking from the book. So I'll do that. But if it feels more appropriate to sort of disintegrate into back and forth, then I'd be very happy with that as well. Um, by way of brief introduction, I do advisory work with client organisations on selecting, defining and mobilising around purpose. I also run a, a non-profit membership community called Marketing Kind for anyone, not just people with marketing in the job title, but anyone who thinks that marketing can have a positive impact on the world or on their day job or ideally both. Um, we upcycle our marketing skills together in support of charities and social enterprises. Um, we uh, coach and support each other in becoming more conscious leaders in the day job. Uh, and we work with some of the world's leading change makers to explore how we can change some of the bigger stories that we work and live by uh, for the better. And then, of course, I write my books to hopefully take some of what I've learned and developed through my advisory work and, and my nonprofit activities and to make that accessible and useful to a broader audience. Um, my first book actually came out about four and a half or just under four and a half years ago. Um, I've probably got a copy here. Um, it was called <laughs> Collaborative Advantage. Um, now, that, that was a time that was not without its problems. Um, in fact, when the book came out, I remember really quite specifically arguing that most of the problems that we faced in business were not problems that any of us could solve on our own um, and that we therefore um, needed to create shared purpose with all of our stakeholders. And so I proposed the model of collaborative advantage as a fundamental alternative to the idea of competitive advantage and where competitive advantage primarily construes the value creation pro process as something that happens inside a business and then is delivered to its stakeholders. And you get ideas like the notion of a consumer as if they're the passive recipient of value. Um, the notion of collaborative advantage that I developed was about working with and through the agency of all of our stakeholders and so could enable us to, to raise the ceiling on our, our level of ambition. And I'd say looking back, that's probably a good job because <laughs> from today's perspective, we might think of the problems of four and a half years ago as the good old problems. Um, <laughs> of course, since then, you know, we've had the biggest global health emergency of our lifetimes, the biggest interruption to life and work as usual that we've ever known. We've had very serious conflict in Europe for some time now. Uh, we have the cost of living crisis um, against the backdrop of a worsening climate emergency, the failure of some of nature's most important systems and important shortages uh, of resources. So if, if joint problems gave rise to the need for shared purpose and collaborative advantage, uh, I now suggest that bigger problems uh, means that we need to uh, upgrade our purpose in the first place. And so uh, hence the, the new book, The Purpose Upgrade, with the um, not understated subtitle change your business to save the world uh, change the world to save your uh, business now i spend most of my time uh, working with leaders from three groups really first of all business leaders seeking to make a profit uh, then leaders of charities and social enterprises seeking to create social change and as it happens i've spent a lot of time with leaders working in the field of disasters and emergencies, seeking to enable survival and recovery. Now, on the face of it, those aspirations are very different. Uh, but of course, as soon as you start to scratch away at the surface, uh, they're deeply connected. You know, anyone working in the field of disasters and emergencies recognizes increasingly the need uh, to achieve whole of society solutions to match the scale of the problems that they're working on. Um, very few charities and social enterprises uh, have access to easy pots of money that they can simply siphon towards their beneficiaries, but have to work incredibly hard 
to achieve systemic change by creating benefits for all of their stakeholders, including but not limited to their beneficiaries. Uh, and of course, business leaders are facing uh, having to take responsibility for a bewildering array of complex issues that were maybe not what they'd signed up for when they started a career in business. Uh, and of course, businesses are increasingly recognizing that making a better contribution to people's lives and playing a greater role in society um, can be a tremendous source uh, of business advantage. Now, all of this, of course, involves purpose level adaptation or purpose level change. And so throughout, I'm going to be encouraging us to think about purpose as a more renewable resource um, than we usually think about it. And I think the, the need for purpose level change is only going to continue uh, to rise as our incumbent business models and even patterns of living and working become more urgently unviable. You know, predictions are tricky <laughs> to make. Um, in Collaborative Advantage, I did write about the risk of a global pandemic well before COVID, um, but that was not a prediction. Um, and looking to the future, it is, if we think about some of the problems I've cited, very difficult to know, for example, the degree to which the climate emergency will give rise to a context of greater global cooperation uh, or drive greater conflict or, or whether the cost of living crisis will ultimately lead to bigger thinking and to breakthroughs um, or simply drive more retrenchment in organisations or whether the degree to which technology will take us more towards automated luxury or actually create new fragilities and leave us more rather than exposed to risk in many important ways. But I think something that we can anticipate in our more crisis prone world is that as these big questions play out, they will continue to create rapid, extensive and often quite profound shifts in the priority needs of the people around us, the priority needs of the, the stakeholders who we serve. Uh, and so that's why I believe that learning how to better repurpose our organizations and activities within them to meet those needs, you know, rather than continuing with business as usual or to foster spurious consumerism is really the biggest business opportunity available to us. Now, researching the book, I found some support for the thesis, for example, in a, a Harvard Business Review article that argued that the 20 most significant corporate turnarounds of the past decade had involved purpose level change. Um, one example that I worked worked quite extensively on uh, in the book with um, all of the leadership team was a, a coal mining business <laughs> that has managed to become a sustainable food business working explicitly to fix the world's broken food system. Now that, that business is called DSM. Um, DSM originally stood for Dutch State Mines uh, and the company was born literally from digging coal out of the ground and delivering it to people's homes for heating and illumination. Uh, and in making the transition from what was once a perfectly respectable endeavor, but which has become very problematic, to becoming a pioneering champion of important sustainable development goals and a far more successful business as a result. I mean, it's worth more than seven times more than when one of the CEOs I worked with um, took the company over. Um, I believe that DSM is an interesting example of the kinds of purpose upgrade that we need much more of across the economy. Now, the trouble is that there is a huge amount that holds us back from achieving purpose upgrades, even when we're perfectly willing. Um, and so some of this is in the form of the stories we tell ourselves, especially in the West. Some of it is in the form of our management models and some of it is in the form of human psychology. So in the West, the, you know, the typical story is the redemption narrative and a lot of business plans follow this pattern. Problem is A, if we achieve solution B, then C, we get to live happily ever after. Uh, now, yeah, the problem is, of course, that happily ever after never comes. Um, and I think this feeds into the way we think about corporate purpose. So, for example, um, redemption narratives give, you know, make you think of the star of Bethlehem and lo and behold, the North Star is often an analogy for purpose in business, even very well intentioned purpose. Um, and of course, a North Star of purpose has the 
upside that it gives us a direction to travel. So it's, it can be useful, but it's limited by the fact that it's a fixed object of the North Star. And of course, in a human context, our problems are always changing. So for example, the North Star analogy really does not explain why communities are often at their most purposeful when they've been hit by a disaster or an emergency and are having to pursue a completely new goal altogether than anything that they previously anticipated. We're told that purpose is about authenticity. And again, it has the merit that we can't really pursue a purpose that is not true to who we are, but you don't really achieve meaningful purpose from introspection alone. You know, there's no point in providing an authentic experience of gastronomic delight in an environment of food poverty. Uh, we're also told that purpose is about single mindedness. And of course, focus is required for action. But in an enterprise context, there are huge numbers of different aspirations in play. And so it's more about integration and alignment. Otherwise, you fall victim to issues such as um, Brewdog, which is a, a company which has done extraordinarily well in terms of its environmental credentials. It's a carbon negative beer, um, but has really come a cropper in terms of its reputation for how it engages with colleagues. And that's undermined the stance that it's tried to take on, on social issues um, as a result. Um, if we think about some of the other uh, ways we think about purpose, CSR, uh, ESG, uh, sustainable business, uh, social enterprise, um, cooperatives, B Corps, you know, these all have huge contributions to make, but none of them actually gives us a generative purpose to pursue with a business in the first place. So you end up with anomalies such as, you know, the refinitive data in 2021 cited uh, British American tobacco as the third best ESG performer in the world. You know, just because a business can be sustained doesn't mean that it is solving purposeful um, problems. And then I talked about human psychology. I'll just give three examples of this because there are so many ways in which human psychology can inhibit us from uh, taking a, achieving a purpose upgrade. And of course, our ability um, to tell ourselves stories of purpose that help us transcend our immediate circumstances in pursuit of some greater good beyond our immediate circumstances is really the primary um, differentiation between us and other species. You know, it's why, unlike other species, we haven't just evolved, but have been able to develop from generation to generation in ways which is um, unique to us. It's why I talk about homo propositus or purposeful man um, in the book. Um, now, the trouble is that when we tell ourselves a story of purpose, we quickly relegate it to our subconscious so we can get on with it. Um, but if circumstances change, that can cause a problem. You know, too easily, the solutions to yesterday's problems continue to act through us, making us more the puppets of our prior expectations and purpose rather than the true authors of our own future change or as I put it in the book where purpose was a powerful lens through which to direct our actions a powerful conscious lens it can at that point become a dangerous unconscious set of blinkers that can blind us to more important realities uh, and hold us back from taking very necessary courses of action particularly where the need for that action comes from outside our prior scope of reference. So this explains, for example, <laughs> coming back to the context of disasters or emergencies, why it is very common for people to underreact rather than overreact to, an un to a, a threat that they haven't previously experienced. If you take the, the Twin Towers, for example, there were more excess fatalities, not from people panicking and pushing each other out the way as they tried to escape the building, but from people just moving too slowly down the stairs because they hadn't fully absorbed the urgency uh, of the danger. I think this explains how many businesses fail. You know, even very powerful organisations can turn out to be surprisingly fragile in the face of the psychological effects of their sunk costs the plan continuation biases of their leaders and the progress traps through which 
uh, the actions and expectations that gave rise to today's success can be the very thing that causes tomorrow's failure. And we know from the historians uh, that this even affects human civilizations as a whole. Uh, when they're unable to bring a new story of purpose to bear in changing how they live and work when faced with new social or environmental stresses. So, for example, we might think of the ancient Sumerians who were unable to wean themselves off the agriculture that they'd grown to love when it became apparent that it was depleting the quality of their soil, um, or the Roman Empire, which, of course, collapsed under its own weight when its model of slave labor dependent growth became far too unwieldy. Now the bad news is that we perhaps face bigger social and environmental stresses today um, than certainly at most other periods in, in history and on certainly a, an unprecedented scale. Um, I think that the good news is that even identifying the problem in seeing purpose as too fixed rather than an adaptive capacity can help us to overcome it. You know, in the, I don't know, probably is co conceptualized slightly differently from country to country. In, in the UK, we have the phrase designated driver, which was a concept that was used to um, help address the more prevalent problem of drink driving, you know, earlier in, in, in our lives, um, just the very notion of a designated driver created the social norm that it was a, a positive thing rather than a negative thing to be the person in the group who, who wouldn't drink. Um, in the, so in the book, I believe, I, I write that I believe that this will become a whole new era in the evolution of enterprise adaptation. You know, so in environments of change, we learned to innovate incrementally, then more disruptively, and we form, formulated those ideas in response to change. Um, with the arrival of the internet and digital communications technology, we've learned not just to innovate, but to transform our organizations and how they operate. And I believe that today, uh, our opportunities are so interconnected and the threats that we face are so interdependent that we're going to have to learn to get much better, not just at innovating and transforming, but at fundamentally repurposing our organizations, repurposing activities within them and pursuing different types of success altogether. So in the book, I pull together a commentary, a call to action, and hopefully a very practical methodology that people can use to find more important problems to solve in the first place to build solutions that enroll their stakeholders on more meaningful journeys of change and to achieve um, more inclusive outcomes that reward participation in those journeys. Uh, since Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, um, we've been led to believe that if we pursue self-directed interest first, we're meant to end up with a collective good as the happy byproduct. And I think we know that that's kind of broken down for um, how economies work today. Somebody recently quipped that Adam Smith's invisible hand is invisible because it's not really there. Um, the good news, however, is that both reason and evidence suggest that if, on the other hand, we start with a desire to contribute to our stakeholders' lives, we can then derive our own self-directed reward as the happy byproduct, as our share of the far greater overall, what I describe in the book as wealth of change that comes from making our businesses a, a, a channel for something greater than themselves. Um, now, quite often a, a new perspective can come just by asking ourselves a different set of questions. So I thought I would uh, just close with a, a few questions for you. Um, a macro question, you know, what, what would it take as a, th as a thought experiment? What would it mean if instead of trying to create the best businesses in the world, in our sectors, we instead thought about trying to create the best businesses for the world? Um, and uh, if we're not all thinking about an entire organization's purpose all the time, then there is also, you know, this can be fractal. So uh, one way that we can achieve a mini purpose upgrade at any scale, you know, even if it is 
one of us serving one individual customer, we can apply this sort of mini purpose upgrade format, which is simply to ask ourselves three questions. Now, first of all, in the context that we're addressing, what is actually needed? Uh, so this involves taking off our organizational hat and just looking neutrally what is needed in that place and time by those people. Secondly, how can that best be achieved? And that's leaving our organizational hat off still, because oftentimes the solution doesn't come from us. You know, even an individual customer, they have something they want to do. Uh, sometimes us getting out the way and understanding what that goal is can be better. You know, when we think about, you know, one of the peer groups here is customer experience. We have to remember that the majority of a customer's experience is not due to us, the majority of a customer's experience is what they are doing in their context. So that's the second question. And then thirdly, only for the third question, can we put our organizational hat back on and say, okay, given what is needed and how that can best be achieved, what, what role can we play in enabling that to happen? Um, and so I can give examples, if you like, of for a one-to-one -one customer service context. Um, but from a, a bigger perspective, um, that's about moving from just seeing market opportunities and unique capabilities to something far more profound, which is seeing opportunities for positive social change and a unique and valuable role to play in people's lives. OK, so I think that introduces a few of the ideas and looking forward to hearing a few thoughts back. Thank you very much, Paul. That was really impressive. I think I ran out of uh, room on my <laughs> paper here trying to capture it. So I'm happy that we recorded it so I can come back and flesh out those those good questions. Uh, really, that was really, really good. Um, let me just open it up. Any questions, reflections, answers, perhaps even, Julian? Do you have an answer? Uh, so maybe not an answer, but but just... Paul, out of curiosity, I guess, like, you know, in in Mar like in terms of a client deciding that they need to procure your services, mm -hmm. right? Um, you must have seen a change in terms of their willingness to access uh, purpose-driven marketing from, say, I'm going to just make it up from, say, 10 years ago. Like, it just, it feels like with ESG and everything else that, that people are... Uh, at least talking about purpose to a much greater extent. I think it varies in terms of how authentically they're talking about purpose. But I, I, if I can just be very crass, if I can put it that way, like five years ago was probably a hard sale, sell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm assuming it's gotten marginally easier. But I was just wondering if my a if my assumptions correct, um, yeah. and b if so, what what you know are you seeing people more authentically motivated to engage somebody who wants to market around purpose? Yeah, so there's a lot in there to unpick. I think that the most direct um, response in the spirit of the question is probably to say that I think there's also a certain degree of fear. You know, mm. a lot of people well, who are being expected but, to talk about. Yeah, yeah but yeah, but I mean, I know in B2B marketing, they talk about FUD, right? Fear, uncertainty and doubt. And that usually motivates a sale. <laughs> Yes, well, actually, and it's a criticism made of the marketing profession that, you know, they're often told that if instead of pitching why a service can add value to a business, that they should actually learn from IT. You know, IT goes in and says we need 100K or whatever it might be. Otherwise, look at this awful scenario that we face. And yet in marketing, it's like, oh, we can really do some good if we. So I think there's an element there. Um, I think in, in purpose, when I talk about fear, it's also that a lot of the people who are maybe able to provide a solution, you know, so it, it, the scale is such that um, businesses aren't just looking to work with innovators in the purpose space they're looking for their big agencies and so on to be able to to help guide through this and that's where i think there's a certain amount of fear because a lot of people are being expected to take leadership roles on things that they really don't have much experience of um, to sort of slightly more unpick at some of the assumptions um, in the question i think that business has always been 
purposeful it's just the nature of the purpose is changing so i come out against competitive advantage and maximizing shareholder value but one thing i would never say is that those ideas originated purposelessly you know competitive mm. advantage arose in the 1960s in response to market liberalization and domestic manufacturers finding they were losing customers to overseas entrants and so the idea of competitive advantage actually caught on uh, maximizing shareholder value came about when businesses were becoming increasingly global so there was an increasing separation between a business leadership and its owners and so this was an idea to align those two groups so they were both purposeful it's just that they've been adopted at huge scale and like most good ideas they have serious shadows and a huge amount of uh, negativity has been produced by the shadow effects of those uh, ideas. And so I think that we now need to, to correct that. Um, I think there is a massive rise in the recognition of that, but it is still almost certainly the case that not only are we continuing to create harm faster than we're putting it right, but even the pace at which we're increasing harm is probably faster than the pace at which we're putting it right. So if we're trying to jump the drawbridge, I think the bridge is rising at a faster rate than we're accelerating the car. Thank wow. you. That's really good. Thank you, Paul. Uh, any Closing, I think we have room for one more question, comment, reflection. Uh, anybody wants to uh, jump in? Bernd, were you preparing to say something? Yeah, maybe a comment from my side, which just uh, came to my mind while you were mentioning shareholder value. Maybe we need to redefine what value is. Yeah, I think I think that's really, really, really important. You know, it's values is something that one of the things I argue in the book is that we can upgrade all dimensions of purpose. Now, I think there was a Groucho Marx line. Those are my principles. And if you don't like them, I have others. Uh, and we've tended to ridicule the notion that we can change what we mean by values. But of course, my values are different than when I was a teenager. And I hope that they'll be different again by the time I come back to look at, look back at, at my life as a whole. And similarly for, for, for businesses. And I think that we have to remember that money, most of it doesn't exist. It's numbers on servers. Um, uh, and really, it, those numbers in context form part of a bigger picture of ideas, trust and relationships. And so we need to recognize that those the ideas, trust and relationships are the bigger picture and the numbers are contingent on those things, not, not the other way around. Shall I finish with one tiny anecdote, um, yeah, which is from the um, Prussian uh war of liberation against napoleon so it's an unusual business case study but the genius move was this um the um uh the the the, the monarchy uh, asked the aristocrats to contribute their gold jewelry to fund an uprising against napoleon um and the genius move was that they replaced those items of jewelry with replicas made of iron and with a patriotic inscription. And so all of a sudden, uh, it became very unfashionable to wear gold jewelry, um, but it became a status symbol to wear iron jewelry because that showed that you were pursuing and capable of pursuing a different vision of success. And I think that actually at the most fundamental level, we need types of leadership in politics, business and civil society that is able to paint a picture of a new type of success. And I think most of us, uh, I think we would be surprised with the number of people who are willing to embrace a different version of success when it is made accessible to them. You know, just as, you know, a surprising number of people enjoyed aspects of lockdown and, and not having to commute anymore. Thank you, Paul. We're in slight overtime, as they say also at the World Cup. Thank you for finding the time to talk to us. I thought it was amazing. It's Christmas holidays, Thanksgiving. Uh, so don't forget to support your local bookshop and uh, you can find this book, I think pretty much everywhere. Um, thank you, Paul, really appreciate it. It was amazing. Hope we can meet in person and continue the conversation next year.
Yeah, I'd love that. Thank you, Paul. Bye. Thank you. Bye.